Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about Juvenile Justice Act of 2015 amended in 2021. I am Dr. Suresh Padadmat, Professor of Psychiatry working at Nimans, Bangalore. Before I start my presentation, I would like to place this disclaimer. This presentation is for academic and training purpose only. And for legal opinion, please do contact an advocate. Conflict of interest? None. In this video, I am going to discuss about Juvenile Justice Act of 2015 amended in 2021. What is the background of this legislation? And also, what are the principles should be followed when implementing this Juvenile Justice Act? This video is targeted to psychiatrists, registered medical practitioners, nurses, advocates, Juvenile Justice Board member, CWC members, mental health professionals, personals working under the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Child Care Institution. The first and the foremost, what is the legal framework we required to bring in the Juvenile Justice Act? The first and the foremost, Constitution of India under Article 15, 39, 45 and 47. I will be discuss them shortly. Further, we had ratified United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child in December 92. That means we need to align our law with the United Convention. Further, to do that, we had brought in a new legislation called as Juvenile Justice Act of 2000, but it did not meet the standard of UNCRC. Hence, we need to amend in 2006, 2011 and a new legislation in 2015 and minor modification in 2021. Further, we also came up with Commission for Protection of Child Rights Act of 2005. But however, we had to come up with a new legislation called as Protection of Children with Sexual Offence Act of 2012, that is POCSO Act of 2012. Now moving to the Constitution of India, Article 15, what does it say? It says, Prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex or place of birth. In Article 15, Clause 3, it says, Nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision for women and children. That means we need to protect children. Hence, the state has the power to make special provisions. Moving to Article 39. It clearly says, The state shall in particular direct its policy towards securing under the E it says that the health and strength of the workers, men and women and tender age of children are not abused. And citizens are not forced by economic necessity to enter a vocation unsuited to their age or strength. So these are the very important points which have been clearly told under the Constitution of India. Moving further, Article 39, further under F says, The children are given opportunities and facilities to develop in a healthy manner and in condition of freedom and dignity and the childhood and youth are protected against exploitation and against moral and material abandonment. So these are the very principles which have been ingrained under the constitution of India. Further, Article 45 also moves ahead and says provision for free and compulsory education for children. Here, the state shall endeavor to provide within a period of 10 years from the commencement of this constitution to provide free and compulsory education for all children until they complete the age of 14 years. What a beautiful constitution. Further, Article 47 also says, duty of the state to raise the level of nutrition and standard of living and to improve public health. In this regard, it also says that prohibition of consumption of any intoxication agents apart from medicinal purposes. So that's where, under this legal framework, we need to come up with a new legislation. Hence, although we had signed United Nations Convention for the Rights of the Children, along with that we have came up with JJ Act and Commission for Protection of Children's Rights Act of 2005 and further Protection of Children from Sexual Offence Act of 2012. Considering all these things, we had to come up with a comprehensive legislation to protect our children. Hence, the new legislation, Juvenile Justice Act of 2015, amended into 2021. Let's discuss this legislation. Although Juvenile Justice Act was passed in 2015, it required minor amendments. Hence, the minor amendments was brought in on 7th of August 
2021. Let's look into this legislation in depth. The first and the foremost is preamble. The preamble is very clear. It talks about two groups of children. One is children in conflict with law. That means a child who has been alleged or committed an offense. That is one. Second, the children in need of care and protection. That means a child who is abandoned, who do not have parents, the children who are living in the streets, the children in conflict with law who requires care and protection. All these children has to be addressed under this legislation. Let's look into the what are those issues. Children in conflict with law. If a child has committed an offense or alleged to be had committed an offense. When you are apprehending this child or if you are detaining this child or you are prosecuting this child, what are the penalties? How the imprisonment will be done? Rehabilitation and social reintegration of the children who are in conflict with law. That is the first important preamble. The second one is the children in need of care and protection. What are the procedures? How the decisions will be taken? Orders relating to the rehabilitation of these children? If the child needs to be adopted because the child is in, on streets and it requires adoption. Reintegration and restoration of these children has been addressed here. If you look at this legislation, it has 10 chapters and 112 sections. If you look at the first important thing is the column is chapters. There are 10 chapters as I mentioned. Further, the title of these chapters and the sections are mentioned in the three columns. That is, if you look at this legislation, it has been beautifully, clearly has been divided. First and the foremost is preliminary which talks about definitions and preamble. The second chapter talks about the general principles which need to be kept in mind when implementing this legislation. The third and fourth chapters which discusses about juvenile justice board and procedures in relation to the conflict with law. That means if the child is in conflict with law, how the JJ board has to be formed and how they are going to monitor the children in conflict with law. That is chapter 3 and 4. Moving to the 5 and 6 chapter, it talks about child welfare committee and procedures for the child welfare committee. And chapter 7 applies for everybody. That is from 1 to 6, it talks about rehabilitation and social integration of children who have committed an offense or alleged to be committed an offense and also children who require care and protection. Chapter 8 is adoption and 9 is offenses against children. Till now we were discussing about child in conflict with law. Now the chapter 9 talks about if somebody commits an offense against the children that will be dealt under chapter 9. Further, the chapter 10th is miscellaneous. Let's look into the definitions. What is the definition of a child? Child means a person who has not completed 18 years of age. It's very crystal clear. Any child below the age of 18 will be considered under this legislation. Moving to child in conflict with law, what does it mean? It clearly says a child who is alleged or found to have committed an offense and who has not completed 18 years of age on the date of commission of the offence. That means it is the date when the offence was committed. It is not when the child was arrested or else when the trial was started or else when the JJ board gives his verdict. It is very clear the date of commission of the crime, what was the age of the child, that is very essential. That means the commission of the crime on that date needs to be kept consideration whether the child belongs under the JJ Act or it will be dealt as an adult. Let's discuss about child in need of care and protection. Who are those children? These are those children who are homeless, begging, living on street. So any of them will be considered as a child who needs care and protection. Orphans or as children, no one is ready to provide care. That means they are abandoned. Working in contravention of labor laws. Those are the children who need to be provided care and protection under this legislation. Homeless mentally ill, disabled children are also considered under this legislation. Further, it's not only with the child. 
if the person who is residing with the child that is parents family members or else guardian who have already been accused of injuring the child or abused the child exploited the child or neglected the child or else the person who is residing the child has threatened to kill the child or else he has killed the child that means the current child who is residing with them is at risk of the same which has happened in the past hence those are the children who need to be protected further it also says person providing care for the child is incapacitated such as mental illness dementia mental retardation head injury so their children who needs care and protection are addressed in this legislation a child who is running away from the house or missing from the house till the day the child reaches back to their family members or reintegrated into the family this legislation will provide care to those children further a child who is likely to be abused or exploited for sexual purposes will be addressed under this legislation further who is likely to be inducted for drug or trafficking will be addressed in this legislation victim of or affected by armed conflict that is terrorism or civil unrest or natural calamity that means the children who are under these circumstances like into the terrorism or civil unrest or natural calamity they will be considered as child in need of care and protection further who is at imminent risk of marriage a child who is about to get married by their family members they are in need of care and protection hence these are the children who have been addressed under this legislation as i mentioned the whole legislation has been divided into eight important components first is child in conflict with law the child need of care and protection rehabilitation and reintegration of the children adoption of children and offenses against the children further miscellaneous let's discuss each one of this component first and the foremost that is child in conflict with law that means it has been addressed in two chapters that is juvenile justice board and procedures for juvenile justice board let's look into this here chapter 3 and chapter 4 discusses about child in conflict with law chapter 3 is very specific how the juvenile justice board is formed and how it is going to be working further chapter 4 talks about procedure for this juvenile justice board section 10 to 26 deals with that further moving to the second component that is child in need of care and protection have been addressed addressed under child welfare committee a committee which is going to look after those children further procedure for these child welfare committee chapter 5 and chapter 6 are dealing with this chapter 5 talks about child welfare committee how this committee will be formed and this is addressed under section 27 to section 30 chapter 6 is very clear procedure with relating to child welfare committee how the child welfare committee is going to work what are the procedures what are the powers what are the responsibility they have been addressed under section 31 to 38 moving to the third important rehabilitation and reintegration of these children it is applying for all children that is both in conflict with law and child who is in need of care and protection that is the institutions that is under chapter 7 that is dealt massively from section 39 to section 55 these are the institutions how the institutions will be registered what are their roles and responsibilities what are the minimum standards who is going to register it how these registrations will be done and who will monitor these institutions that is chapter 7 fourth important component that has been discussed under this legislation adoption here there are important authorities and agencies have been formed first and the foremost specialized adoption agencies will be formed along with that central adoption resource authority will be formed which will be monitored by the steering committee authority further there will be state adoption resource agencies will be formed so these are the agencies and authorities who will monitor the adoption of children across the country and here the adoption is not only within the country inter country adoption or else nri who are coming to adopt the children so these children's who have been adopted how they are monitored how they are cared for and how they need to be protected are addressed under this legislation 
that is chapter 8 which discusses all these agencies and authorities which have been dealt from section 56 to 73. Moving to the other important that is offenses against children. Here the, all those offenses which are committed against children if you look at the JJ board will deal only with child in conflict with law that means the child who has committed an offense. Here the chapter 9 discusses is somebody has committed an offense against a children that is chapter 9 and it is dealt from section 74 to 89 and the last one is miscellaneous. So these are the various chapters which have been clearly determined under the Juvenile Justice Act. Further, I will be discussing each of the component in separate videos. They are available in my YouTube channel. Now let's move into important 16 general principles which need to be followed during the administration of this Juvenile Justice Act. Let's discuss each one of these general principles because without having these general principles, the legislation is very very dry. That means although you may do justice, but the true spirit of reintegrating the child back to the community will not happen. Hence, the law drafter is very clear. They have brought in very important 16 general principles. Let's look into them. The first and the foremost, the principle number one. The principle number one clearly says presumption of innocence. Whenever a child is presumed or alleged to be committed an offense, it will be considered as an innocent. That means he doesn't have a malified intention or a criminal intention until the age of 18. That's have been clearly been said. Although you may do a trial against the child, but you need to consider the child is innocent. The second one is principle of dignity and worth. Here, all human beings, including the child, you cannot just say that he is a child. No, you have to provide dignity and also you have to consider the rights of the children. Coming to the third, principles of participation. Here, the child should not be allowed to participate in his trial. He needs to be heard. He needs to know what are the charges have been framed against him. Considering the age of the child and maturity of the child, that means equal participation has been guaranteed. Further, the principle four, the best interest of the child. All decisions regarding the child shall be based on the primary consideration that they are in the best interest of the child and to help the child to develop fully potential. That means whatever decision you are going to take, it should be in the best interest of the child. Hence, it is considered as best interest principle. Coming to the fifth principle, the principle of family responsibility. That means the primary responsibility of care, nurture and protection of the child shall be that of the biological family or the next will be adoptive or foster parents as the case may be. That means the child needs to be given protection, care under the biological family. Further, principle of safety. All measures should be taken to ensure that the child is safe and is not subjected to any harm, abuse or maltreatment while in contact with care and protection or during if the child in the proceeding of in conflict with law. Coming to the principle number seven, that is positive measures. All resources are to be mobilized including those of the family and the community for promoting the well-being of the child. That means the child needs to be rehabilitated, reintegrated, all resources need to be mobilized, both families and the communities. Further, principle of non-stigmatizing semantics. Hence, these are very important to avoid stigma. The child will be considered as child in conflict with law. You are not going to call as an accused child because it is very derogatory. Further, you are not going to call as a criminal. You are going to call again child in conflict with law. You are not going to call arresting the child. You will be calling as apprehending the child. That means adversarial or accusatory words will not be used against the child. Moving to the ninth important principle, principle of non-waiver of rights. This is very essential. The important thing here you need to understand is if the child does not ex exercise its rights, that does, not, that does not mean the child has wavered of its rights. If the child 
does not ask for legal aid that doesn't mean that the jj board will not give the legal aid that means it is the duty of the jj board or child welfare committee to give the rights of the child even though the child does not ask that means just because the child it does not ask does not means the child has wavered off that means this legislation clearly says that it is the duty of the society it is the duty of the jj board it is the duty of the child welfare committee and all other authorities and agencies formed should not waver off the child rights that's a very important one moving to the principle number 10 principle of equality and non discrimination no child will be discriminated on the based on the grounds of sex caste ethnicity place of birth disability and equal access for opportunity and treatment should be given that is what principle number 10 moving to the principle number 11 principle of right to privacy and confidentiality every child have the right for protection privacy and confidentiality just because a child has committed an offense no journalist will put the photograph of the child or name of the child that means principle of right to privacy and confidentiality is ensured even though the child has committed an offense that is very essential further Principle number 12, principle of institutionalization as a measure of last resort. That means if you are going to put the child in an institution, it may be specialized home, foster care home or anywhere, it should be the last resort. Every attempt should be made to rehabilitate the child in the community within the biological family or foster family or family which has adopted the child. That means you are using the institution as the last resort. Moving to the 13th principle, principle of repatriation and restoration. This needs to be told clearly. Every child in the juvenile justice system shall have the right to be reunited with his family at the earliest and to be restored to the same social, economic and cultural status that he was in before coming under the purview of the act, unless the restoration and repatriation is not in the best interest of the child. That means child need to be reintegrated into the family at the earliest. Moving to the last 14th principle, principle of fresh start. This is one of the landmark principle if you ask. All past records of any child under the juvenile justice system or legislation should be erased except in special circumstances, that is heinous crime. That means if the child has been accused or been convicted under the JJ Act, will not considered as a disqualification for holding a job or considering any job. That means the records will be erased. Only under the heinous crime, it will be kept under the child's court, not with the police. Further, moving to the principle number 15, principle of diversion. Measures for dealing with children in conflict with law without resorting to judicial proceedings shall be promoted unless it is the best interest of the child or the society as a whole. Here, the child will be dealt as much as possible in the JJ board. Otherwise, if it is not done, then considering the legislation, it should be dealt in the child's court. Further, principle of natural justice. Here, the basic procedural standards of fairness shall be adhered to, including the right to fair hearing, rules against bias, right to review by all persons and bodies acting in a judicial capacity under this legislation. That means, principle of natural justice should be followed here. To conclude, my dear friends, the JJ Act is a landmark act to provide care and protection for those children who require and also the children who are in conflict with law. This legislation chapters have been beautifully framed and also placed appropriately. Further, when you are implementing this legislation, you need to follow the general 16 principles which have been recently said that and you need to follow them in the true spirit. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time. Stay safe.